Last month, Cristiano Ronaldo scored his 100th goal in an international soccer match. The record is 109, which Ronaldo should easily break before his career is over. At 35 years old, the billion dollar soccer star is still one of the best footballers in the world. And besides Ferdinand Magellan, he's the only other person I can name of off the top of my head who hails from the nation of Portugal. I'm not trying to be disparaging, by the way. I'm just grossly ignorant of Portuguese culture. And that's a shame because for 600 years, Portugal was one of the greatest empires in all the world. So to help fill in this egregious gap in our knowledge of Portuguese history, today we're going to look at perhaps the greatest woman of the past that you've probably never heard of. Her legal Christian name was Beatrice de Luna, and she was born into one of the wealthiest families in Portugal in 1510. But her secret Jewish name was Dona Gracia Nazi. You see, in 1492, the same year Columbus sailed the ocean blue, Gracia's parents had fled the Inquisition in Spain to live in Portugal. The established church at this time wasn't known for its religious tolerance, and the Pope had declared Jews to be heretics. But unfortunately for Gracia's parents, things weren't much better in Portugal. On Easter Sunday in 1506, after getting blamed for a drought and plague that had struck Lisbon, hundreds of suspected Jews were beaten, tortured, and killed. I'm not sure why people thought it was the Jews' fault, but those in power often look for a scapegoat during hard times. Because of episodes like the Lisbon Massacre, many Jews publicly converted to Christianity in order to avoid persecution, but they continued to practice their Jewish faith in secret. And they became known as the conversos, or the converted ones. The Lisbon Massacre was an ominous precursor of bad things to come for Portuguese conversos. So while the parents of Dona Gracia Nazi were good Catholics outwardly, privately, they studied the Jewish scriptures, celebrated Jewish holidays, and kept a Jewish diet. At the age of 18, Dona Gracia Nazi married another wealthy, wealthy converso named Francisco Mendez. After cornering the market on the Indian spice trade, his family became one of the wealthiest in all of Europe, and so Gracia and Francisco Mendez became a 16th century power couple. Entire governments became indebted to them, but they dare not risk their family fortune by openly practicing their Judaism. In public, they called their only daughter Brianda, but at home she went by the Jewish name Reina. But you can only keep up appearances for so long, and in 1536, everything started to fall apart. Francisco Mendez died, making Gracia a widow at just 28 years old. And that same year, the Inquisition officially came to town to root out the secret Portuguese Jews from among the conversos with threats of torture, seizure of property, and even death. I guess the established church at that time had forgotten that Jesus himself was Jewish, not to mention just about everything else Jesus ever said or did. So Gracia took her daughter and fled to Antwerp, Belgium, to live among relatives there. She went into business with her brother-in-law, who also died a short time later, making Gracia the sole surviving partner of the family business and one of the richest women in Europe. And this only served to intensify the spotlight under which she lived. Kings wanted to marry her. The church wanted to confiscate her property. Despite living in a city that was somewhat tolerant of Judaism, she still dared not blow her religious cover. It was too risky. Anti-Semitism has a long history in Europe. Nonetheless, Gracia worked tirelessly to ferry out persecuted Jews from Spain and Portugal. She conducted an underground railroad of sorts. Her network of confidants smuggled out Jews from among her cargo ships, led them through the Alps, and slipped them across the borders of friendlier nations. But she didn't stop there. Once these Jews were safely relocated, out of her own wealth, Gracia replenished the property that they were forced to leave behind. But despite her tremendous wealth and fulfilling work, Gracia was still not satisfied. She felt like a phony, and she longed for a place where she could practice her faith openly. 
So eventually, they took all the money they could carry with her family, and she moved to the Jewish ghetto of Venice. Surely, she would be safe among other Jews. But even there, she found that in order to keep up her business, she had to keep up Catholic appearances. There seemed to be no place in Europe where Judaism was fully tolerated. So Gracia continued living in discontent until the Turkish sultan invited her to live in Constantinople. The sultan didn't care what religion you were as long as you're willing to put money into his kingdom. Finally, Gracia could be free. But before she could get out of Venice, Gracia's Jewish identity was betrayed by a family member. And she was imprisoned. The sultan was infuriated with the prospect of losing Gracia's money to the Venetian authorities. And he threatened to go to war over it. But after two years of negotiation, Gracia was finally released from prison and allowed to settle in Constantinople. She started going by her Jewish name and openly observing Jewish holidays and traditions. She continued to use her vast fortune to aid her persecuted brothers and sisters all over the world. She paid to redeem Jewish slaves. She fostered Jewish culture and history and music and poetry. She supported hospitals, schools, synagogues, and charities in her own hometown. She even convinced the Sultan to aid in the establishment of Jewish communities in the Holy Land. Dona Gracia Nazi saved the lives of thousands of Jews, and the work she started in the 16th century planted the seeds for the eventual establishment of the Jewish state of Israel in 1948. With all due respect to Magellan and Ronaldo, Dona Gracia Nazi should be considered the greatest Portuguese figure of all time. She was wealthy, she was generous, and she saved her people and made her mark on history. Yet, peace always seemed to elude her. All her life, she searched and searched for a place where she could safely identify as a Jew in public. But once she found it, she quickly became disillusioned and withdrew from public life before dying of illness in 1569 at the age of 59 in Constantinople. Dona Gracia Nazi spent most of her life on the run, always looking for a place to call home. And that's how the Jewish people have survived all these centuries. But for some people, mere survival isn't enough. At some point, they must stop and make a stand. And for three Hebrew young men in our passage today, their time had come. So I'm going to encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 3. Daniel chapter 3, or you can pull out your smartphone or tablet and look up the passage on an app. Daniel chapter 3, and as always, there's notes in your bulletin if you'd like to follow along. This is installment number 4 of our sermon series on the life and times of the prophet Daniel entitled King of Beasts. The book of Daniel is unlike any other in the Bible. The author used a wide-angle lens to focus on world history one moment and then zoomed in to focus on Daniel and his friends the next. He seamlessly transitioned from historical narrative to apocalyptic literature. We'll see Daniel face both literal physical beasts in the den of lions and ferocious figurative beasts in the epic visions he had about the future that God gave him. But whether on the grand scale or the personal, we can be confident that our God will forever be king of beasts. So let's take a moment to catch up everyone who may have missed the first few messages. As a child, Daniel watched his Jewish nation collapse under the weight of its own corruption as King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon swooped in and conquered in 586 BC. And Nebuchadnezzar had a policy of exporting his pagan Babylonian culture to all the nations that he conquered in order to maintain unity within his growing empire. So he handpicked the best and brightest Hebrew young men and forcibly relocated them to his capital in Babylon to undergo what can only be described as an indoctrination process. They learned the language, history, religion, magic, and astrology of the Babylonians. But Daniel and his three friends, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, were not commit with, uh, content with merely surviving in a foreign land. They were determined to maintain their Jewish identity openly. And as they diligently sought after God, they were rewarded with powerful positions in Nebuchadnezzar's administration. 
But as we're going to see in our passage today, this would not sit well with the Babylonian wise men. They expected Daniel and his three friends to merely survive, not thrive. But when these Hebrew young men started winning promotions over them, the wise men could stop at nothing to destroy them. And they found their opportunity when King Nebuchadnezzar decided to establish a single empire-wide religion. Let's take a look at it. Daniel chapter 3, let's start in verse 3. It says, in the satraps, the prefects, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the justices, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province gathered for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up, and the herald proclaimed aloud, You are commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. Therefore, as soon as all the peoples heard the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music, all the peoples, nations, and languages fell down and worshiped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Now remember, Nebuchadnezzar, was obsessed with establishing cultural unity among the nations he conquered. And there's nothing more important to a culture than its religion. Like the inquisitors after him, Nebuchadnezzar had no qualms about using the threat of violence to force conversions. And as we just saw from this passage, the threat of violence gets results, at least outwardly. Without exception, every official in Babylon bowed down to the idol Nebuchadnezzar had set up. King Nebuchadnezzar knew the power of man's survival instincts. He knew there was no greater force within a man than his will to survive, and he leveraged that force to his advantage. So our main point from today's passage is this, and you can write it in your bulletin if you'd like. The main point is survival has no rival. Our survival instincts are not rivaled among any other force in our lives. As humans, we survive first. In the New Testament, the Apostle Peter understood both the power and the danger of man's brute instincts. 2 Peter 2.12, he says, But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed. Peter described to a T these officials that were in Babylon. They didn't even think about what they were doing. Their survival instincts kicked in, and of course they fell on their knees and worshipped this idol. And that's what anyone would do when faced with a fiery death. Well, almost anyone. Let's pick up the story, Daniel chapter 3, in verse 8. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and maliciously accused the Jews. They declared to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music shall fall down and worship the golden image. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into a burning, fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over the affairs of the province of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, pay no attention to you. They do not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. Now, no one likes a tattletale. Doesn't the smarminess of these Chaldeans just make your skin crawl? Remember, Daniel had saved these guys' bacon in the previous chapter. Daniel could have let Nebuchadnezzar kill these guys when they were exposed as phonies for not being able to interpret his dream in chapter 2. And this is how they return the favor. As soon as Daniel was absent on business somewhere, they tried to destroy his three friends. To the Hebrew young men who had committed to maintaining their Jewish faith openly in this foreign land, worshiping an idol was simply out of the question. It cut to the heart of their distinctly monotheistic religion. But surely they could have wiggled their way out of this, right? I mean, how do you define worship in the strictest sense? Perhaps they could have bowed the knee on the outside, but worshiped God on the inside. 
And in the process, they could have satisfied Nebuchadnezzar while at the same time keeping the letter of their religious law. And nobody would have thought anything of it. Nobody would have judged him. They had to survive, after all. Since our theme today seems to be heroic women of history, I would be derelict not to mention the great African-American woman who was arrested for refusing to give up her seat on a Montgomery, Alabama bus line in order for a white person to sit down. Her name was Claudette Colvin. Wait a minute, what about Rosa Parks? Well, Rosa Parks was an amazing woman of courage and conviction in her own right. But nine months before Rosa Parks made her famous stand, a teenager named Claudia Colvin did the very same thing. And in many ways, Claudette's story is even more compelling. On the afternoon of March 2nd, 1955, Claudette was riding the bus home after school with her friends, as she did every day. And as was often the case, as the bus started filling up, the bus driver demanded that the black girls move back to the back of the bus, to which they all complied. All of them, that is, except for Claudette. Something got into her that day, and she refused to budge. Nine months later, Rosa Parks, a young secretary for the NAACP, would do the very same thing on the same bus system, and she would become the face of the Montgomery bus boycott. And Parks' brave act of defiance would be carefully planned for maximum impact. But Claudette made her stand on the spur of the moment. There were no photographers, and there was no one waiting at the jail to advocate for her. She was arrested, she was locked up, and she was alone and terrified. Her astonished friends who had watched the entire spectacle unfold from the back of the bus ran home to tell her mother. The family pastor bailed Claudette out of jail and her entire neighborhood stayed up all night to make sure nothing happened to her family. Claudette Colvin would go down in history as becoming one of the four plaintiffs of Browder versus Gale, the court case that overturned bus segregation in Alabama. That's quite a legacy, isn't it? What, what a great story from history. But here's my point. No one would have judged Claudette if she had gotten up and moved to the back of the bus with her friends. No one would have thought less of her. No one would have blamed her. No one would have accused her of doing something wrong or being a sellout. And everyone would have moved on with their normal lives. But that day, Claudette was unwilling to compromise or even give the appearance of compromise with something that was going on that was evil. And the same spirit that got into her must have gotten into the three Hebrew young men in our passage today. Let's pick up the story, Daniel chapter 3 and verse 16. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the burning, fiery furnace. And he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image you have set up. You know, I suppose most people who read this passage are inspired, but I can't help but to be a bit discouraged. I'm reluctant to do anything at all that might disrupt my normal routine, let alone do something that could jeopardize my physical well-being. I would be terrified, especially as a young teenager, there's no way I would have been able to do what Claudette Colvin did, let alone Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They had no assurances from God that they were going to survive this ordeal. This was ball game. And almost no one does this kind of thing. The human in instinct to survive is just too powerful. It has no rival. Sure, we hear some stories about history's heroes like we've talked about this morning, but think about all the millions and millions of people who just went along with the crowd. For the vast majority of us, when our survival is threatened, our instincts take over. Maybe you can relate better to the story of Thomas Bilney from 16th century England. As a young student at Cambridge, he grew tired of the cold mechanical system of worship in the established church. Surely there had to be more to religion than just lighting candles and doing mindless penance, Bill, Bill Nee thought. So he started reading the New Testament for himself. 
And he was struck by these words from the Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy 1.15. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. If Jesus could save the worst of sinners, Bilney reasoned, then surely he could save him. Little Bilney, as he was affectionately known for his short stature, continued reading, and his eyes were open to the truth. Jesus lived the perfect life he couldn't live. Jesus died on the cross for his sins, and Jesus was resurrected three days later to prove it. And Thomas Bilney, just as we are, was saved by God's grace from, from his sins and from hell and from everything else through faith alone. And not by the works that the church demanded. Look what Paul says, Ephesians 1, 7. In him, Jesus, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. So Thomas Bilney started preaching these truths throughout London. Well, you can guess what happened next. As we already mentioned, the church in those days wasn't exactly known for uh, being tolerant of dissenting ideas. So Bilney was arrested and charged with heresy. But unlike Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the three young men who took a courageous stand for God in the face of a fiery death, little Bilney folded like a cheap suit when threatened with the prospect of burning at the stake. And in a humiliating ordeal, he publicly recanted the error of his ways and resubmitted to the authority of the church. While Thomas Bilney's actions may not be heroic, they are without a doubt human. Can you imagine how bad it would hurt to get burned alive? The poor guy just wanted to survive. But our obsession with mere survival goes even deeper than matters of life and death like we've talked about today. We do whatever it takes to survive at work. If we have to cook the books, then so be it. We have to eat after all, and we do whatever it takes to survive at school. If we have to stand by and watch someone else get ridiculed and abused, then so be it. At least it's not us. And we do whatever it takes to survive at home. We let everything slide because we're barely keeping our heads above water, and we stay silent when we should say something. We go along with things outwardly while inwardly we feel terrible about it. Why? Because we're human. We don't want to suffer. It goes against every natural inclination in us as humans to do something that doesn't seem to be in our immediate best interest. Survival instincts are powerful. They make us do things we know we shouldn't, and they make us not do things we know we should. And that's why this story is so striking to us. These young people did something that not even the great Dona Gracia Nazi could do. They countermanded their survival instincts. They somehow knew something that we don't. And I think we get a taste of it at the end of our passage. Let's pick it up again, Daniel 3 and verse 19. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with fury, and the expression of his face was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He ordered the furnace heated seven times more than it was usually heated, and he ordered some of the mighty men of his army to bind Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and to cast them into the burning, fiery furnace. Then these men were bound in their cloaks, their tunics, their hats, and their other ornaments, and they were thrown into the burning, fiery furnace. Because the king's order was urgent and the furnace overheated, the flame of the fire killed those men who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell bound into the burning, fiery furnace. Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished and rose up in haste, and he declared to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the fire? They answered and said to the king, True, O king. And he answered and said, But I see a fourth man unbound walking in the midst of the fire, and they are not hurt, and the appearance of the fourth is like a son of the gods. Then Nebuchadnezzar came near to the door of the burning, fiery furnace. He declared, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, Servants of the Most High God, come out and come here. Then Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out from the fire. So do you see what happened here? Do you see how they were able to override their survival 
instinct. Did you see why they were able to make their heroic stand even in the face of a fiery death? God was in their midst. And I don't think God just happened to appear when Nebuchadnezzar looked into the furnace. God had been there all along. No one could see him until the end, but he had been there the whole time. How do I know that? Because God had promised it long ago. Psalm 23, 4, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you, God, are with me. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had undoubtedly sung that Hebrew song since they were li little. They believed that it was true. And then they saw that it was true. Your human instincts to merely survive are strong. Left to ourselves, we will follow those instincts every time. But your survival instincts can be overridden. They can be countermanded. They can be circumvented. But the only way this can happen is to walk with Jesus in the midst of the fire. And that's our application from today's passage. It's in your bulletin. If you'd like to write it down. The application is blunt your instincts by walking in sync with Jesus. You can blunt your instincts by walking in sync with Jesus. I need to tie up a loose end this morning. After Thomas Bilney's recantation, he fell into deep despair. He felt like he had let down the Lord by choosing survival over truth. His friends were afraid to leave him alone, as a matter of fact, and they tried desperately to comfort him. He's only human, after all, and burning at the stake would be a terribly painful way to go. But Bilney would have none of it. After a few years of deep soul-searching and intense Bible study, he resumed his preaching of the gospel. And again, he was arrested and charged with heresy, as he sat in a dank jail cell reading the Bible by candlelight with some friends, he contemplated the fiery ordeal that awaited him if he wouldn't recant. And he decided to test himself. So he put his fingers near the fire of the candle. But then he recoiled in horror. It hurt so bad. And he chided himself, What, canst not thou bear the burning of one member? And how will thou endure tomorrow the burning of thy whole body? Don't you feel sorry for this poor little guy? But then the Spirit of God reminded him of this prophet from the prophet Isaiah. And everything changed for him. He wrote about it. Isaiah 43, 2. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And though the rivers, they shall not consume you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned and the flame shall not consume you. Wasn't the part about the flames not burning him that comforted him, because those flames would burn him. It was the I will be with you part that changed everything. His survival instincts were overridden by the promise of God's presence to walk with him through the ordeal. And this time, when he faced the flames, he didn't falter. As his body was consumed, he cried out Jesus' name. Jesus was there with him, you see. And he repeated the Latin word, credo, over and over again, which means, I believe. The story of little Thomas Bilney gives hope to us who can be chickens sometimes. He was one of us. And left to himself, he faltered. But when faith opened his eyes to the very real and present Spirit of God walking in sync with him through the trial, his survival instincts were blunted. And this theme is found all over the New Testament. When Jesus talked about the disciples' future persecution, he said this in Mark 10, When they deliver you over, do not be anxious how you are to speak or to what you are saved, for what you are to say will be given to you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the Spirit of your Father speaking through you. Before Stephen was being martyred, he saw a vision of Christ standing with him in Acts 7. But he, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Jesus was there in the midst of the ordeal. 
When the Apostle Paul was tempted to quit preaching the gospel among the hostilities he faced in Corinth, God appeared to him and promised this in Acts 18. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking and do not be silent, for I am with you. Listen, not even Jesus did it alone in his darkest hour. In John 16, 32, it was, he said, Behold, this hour is coming. Indeed, it has come when you will be scattered each to his own home. And will leave me, but yet I am not alone, but the Father is with me. You don't need to worry about the trials you may have to face because you can't rely on your own courage to face them anyway. You can't rely on the power of your conviction. These things aren't strong enough to override your survival instincts, but you can rely on the power of presence of Jesus. As did the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 4. He says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon to test you as though something strange were happening to you, but rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings that you may also rejoice and be glad when His glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the Spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. Now, none of us are facing a literal fiery trial today, thank God. But understanding that Christ shares in our everyday sufferings allows us to do good things we never thought we'd be able to do. It overrides our survival instincts to run so we can defend the oppressed. It countermands our impulse to sin and allows us to walk away from evil. It circumvents our urges to stay silent when we know we should say something. It's time to break the power of mere survival in our lives. Dona Gracia Nazi was a great and courageous woman, but I don't want to live my life forever on the run. Survival has no human rival, and left to ourselves, we choose survival every time. But we can blunt our human instincts by walking in sync with the divine. See Jesus in your trial. Feel him in it. Believe with all your heart that he is there because he's promised to be there. Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Let a little while and the world will see you no more, but you will see me because I live. You also will live. And this ironclad promise is as faithful and true as the one who said it. Now, Nebuchadnezzar hasn't been painted in a positive light so far, but as we'll see next week, this episode really had an effect on him. The truth is, Nebuchadnezzar, for all his moments of temporary insanity, was a strong and capable leader in history, and God in his mercy and grace is not going to let him go. God is going to work on him. So read Daniel chapter 4 this week, and you bring a friend next Sunday and we'll see Nebuchadnezzar get taken to the brink and back. Let's pray. Lord, I want to thank you so much that uh, you are so good to us, that you love us so much. And Lord, I know that we go through life just merely trying to survive because in some ways that's how we were created. Lord, I pray you would blunt those instincts, though, when we are faced with a fiery ordeal that we would be able to do what's right, not out of our own courage and strength of our own conviction, which fails all the time, but with the simple faith and the knowledge of the fact that you will walk with us. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.